Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to our webinar tonight. Uh, this is Manos Prilakis, and it's my great pleasure to introduce you to the webinar entitled My Work at PCI Complications of the Past Year. Um, we are privileged to have uh, two outstanding faculty to present with a goal to show you what really happens in the cath lab. Both of them are extremely experienced and uh, uh, know how to keep their cool and their calm during the storm. And this is, if you go to the next slide, um, this is uh, uh, CME accredited. So you can uh, claim CME um, at the end of the webinar by going to the link which we'll show you. And there are no fits for doing that. Once again, it's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Wissam Jabber, who is the Cath Lab Director from Emory University, a great city operator for many years, and also D Dr. Jason Walworth, uh, the Director of Complex Coronary Interventions from the Providence Heart Institute in Oregon. Also, tremendous uh, operator with uh, many, many years of experience that have shared many cases over the years. I would like to thank uh, some of the sponsors for this webinar, which is Abbott and Shockwave. And then also remind everyone that uh, in just a little over a month, we are going to have uh, the um, full CBI meeting. And this is the link for the webinar, which is on the CBI website, which uh, this year is going to happen in Austin, Texas on July 20 to 22. So, if you want to see more complications and exciting items, please join us in Austin. And then uh, uh, to finish up, there are also a lot of other pre-recorded uh, recorded, uh, material that you're welcome to see in um, um, the CBA website. So without further ado, Wissam and Jason, welcome. And Jason, I think um, you are the first one to share your cases. Thank you both for coming tonight. I'm super excited to discuss with you how we can prepare for these complications. Thanks, Manos. Uh, it's great to, to join you and uh, Wisdom. And uh, unfortunately, we get to show some of our disasters. And I always hate it when I get invited to do complications because I, I, I uh, it, it means I'm an expert in them and maybe maybe I cause a few too many. But um, uh, this actually, I, I decided to show a couple of cases of hemodynamic collapse in the cath lab. Uh, this idea kind of came up because I had a case about three weeks ago uh, where this happened. And I thought, oh boy, this might be an interesting topic to review because it's not something that we generally review uh, as much. We, we tend to review the, the, the specific things that cause uh, hemodynamic collapse, but not kind of an overall view of hemodynamic collapse in the cath lab. So the first case, uh, I'm going to show two quick cases, one from a few weeks ago and then one from uh, about a year and a half ago. Uh, they kind of had hemodynamic collapse for different reasons, and, and one, uh, and, and they were managed differently. Um, and, and so maybe we can have some discussion about uh, what we could have potentially done better. So the first case is a gentleman that uh, presented with about six weeks of gradually progressive exertional angina, ended up having a stress test ordered by his primary, where he only went two minutes and had inferior and anterior ST segment depression, about three millimeters with a high Duke, uh, Duke treadmill score. He was referred to one of my general cardiology colleagues and was referred for angiogram. But, but the day before he was supposed to have his angiogram, he got admitted to an outside hospital with uh, severe upper abdominal pain and chest pain. His, his cardiac workup was unremarkable, but a CT scan so showed some mesenteric stranding and an ultrasound showed uh, evidence of cholecystitis. So he was actually admitted there and was seen by general surgery, but they didn't think he obviously was a great surgical candidate because of this recent high-risk stress test. So they decided to treat him conservatively and then they put him on antibiotics. But uh, during that hospitalization, he kind of got worse and worse. He was having more and more uh, abdominal pain, larger uh, amounts of uh, narcotic requirements, and his uh, white blood cell, cell count uh, was climbing and he was persistently febrile. So eventually was transferred to our institution and had a, a cholecystostomy placed uh, and did get somewhat better after this. And he was discharged uh, a few days later on antibiotics. So he was referred uh, to see me uh, 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 for uh, an angiogram about six days later. Uh, and at that time, he just complained he was feeling lousy. He was having uh, angina just simply ambulating around his house. He was having a lot of pain from the cholecystostomy tube and difficulty with deep breathing because of, uh, of, the, of the tube as well. Uh, you can see here on his angiogram, this is his right coronary artery, he had uh, kind of serial high-grade lesions with 
uh, really Timmy two flow into the distal vessel. Uh, uh, so then uh, here's his left coronary system. You can see he's got uh, a fairly uh, at least co-dominant circ system uh, with a high grade left main stenosis uh, that was involving the origin of the LAD and the circumflex. Uh, again, you can see it here in the other view as well. Um, after we got these uh, angiograms, I, I uh, uh, had my surgeon come by um, and, and reviewed the case with him. Uh, my surgical colleague says, you know, we can't do anything with this guy. Just go ahead and fix his coronaries right now with PCI. He, he uh, put a note in the chart, fortunately, uh, uh, before we did the procedure saying that, you know, surgery, open heart surgery is a terrible idea. I like how blunt our surgeons can be sometimes. Uh, I actually did call the general surgeon as well before I proceeded with uh, doing his intervention, uh, and and he recommended just going ahead and fixing him, and that that they could operate on platics down the road if they needed to. Um, here's kind of a picture just showing his the remainder of his LAD and distal vessels actually looked pretty uh, pretty uh, unremarkable. So really felt like it was so, a pretty. So maybe Jason just ask a reason actually because to be honest, I never had a case like this in the setting of cholecystitis, that's uh, that's news to me. I don't know, what do you think? Would your surgeons have said the same or is this maybe not, uh, and I, I don't know, I don't know if that's the right answer or not, but what do you think your surgeon might have said? You know, th th this could be uh, uh, this could be also place specific, and some surgeons are risk averse when it comes to that. There's going to be complications. They always worry about external wound infection and sepsis and things like that. So, I, I would not be surprised that that surgeons in many places would actually say no to cases like this. And it it also depends on how comfortable they are with the interventionist. So, so they work with Jason, and they know that he could fix something that that is uh, as complex as it gets. So, I think they. It's very likely that they send it to him. But at the same time, right? I mean, the patient may need an open surgery. And even with platics on board, if you have a, first, a surgery within the first week, especially after you have stents, I mean, the risk of thrombosis is, even with a new DS, is probably on the high side. So anyway, it's it's fascinating, fascinating case on multiple fronts. Yeah, it's one of the reasons why I wanted to touch base with the general surgeon before I got into this, because... You know, I've had these issues before where, where you know, you don't kind of communicate with them and then they're kind of shocked by what you did. And so I wanted to make sure that we had a plan uh, going forward. And he he actually felt pretty confident that he wasn't going to need any urgent uh, cholecystectomy. He thought he could get by after draining him with the antibiotics that, that he was probably going to be okay. And he was obviously way more concerned about his, his okay. cardiovascular uh uh, risk and 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 he said and even if he did get into trouble he he felt comfortable operating on uh, dual antiplatelet therapy because they've they've done that before so uh, I I felt good that we at least had that conversation before we jumped into this but um, yeah, I think my surgical colleague his main concern just was the the infectious risk and the risks of potentially becoming septic septic and you know he obviously had an indwelling drain as well and so. You know, he looked at the angiogram. I looked at the angiogram. I felt pretty comfortable uh, about fixing it. His LV function was normal, so I thought it was going to be a fairly straightforward, uh, you know, uh, intervention. I actually thought his right coronary artery was likely the more uh, symptomatic uh, vessel, even though it's a relatively small vessel. Um, but uh, but uh, certainly the left main was was significant, and they wouldn't they wouldn't have moved forward if we had just fixed the right. So we just decided to go ahead and do it all. Actually discussed it with the patient as well. So I told him what, what the plan was and he was all for it because I think he had enough of uh, being poked and prodded and was not interested in having a major open heart surgery followed by a cholecystectomy. So said, I thought, I think we can get, just take care of this right here. So we actually didn't even take him off the table, which I don't do a whole lot uh, um, you know, with, with left main disease unless somebody's really... Uh, you know, symptomatic, but again, this guy was getting worse and worse and really having symptoms just walking around his house. So uh felt like it was it was reasonable to just proceed. So we I would, uh, I would have I would have Jason maybe taken a different route, maybe of fixing his left main and his his RCA seems to be pretty diffusely diseased distally and and kind of it's the more important vessel is left main could, could yeah. have just gone down. Yeah, I think it, prognostically certainly it's more important, but I also thought that that the uh, the the right was potentially causing more of the unstable symptoms because it really had slow flow, 
Um, and it actually plumped up. It was a pretty good sized vessel once we got some flow down there. Yeah. Uh, kind of see here on the right, uh, you know, we we put, uh, I think, three stents in, you know, kind of from the right from the crux all the way back up to the proximal vessel and and got a good result and tolerated it just fine. Um, you can that, make the argument too, Jason, that actually fixing the right makes the left main safer, right? Because you're starting the left main and you have a severe lesion on the right, but then if you get ischemic on the main, your backup is less. Yeah, yeah, and and well, quite quite honestly, with what happened uh, when we started on the left main, you'll you'll uh, I, I was glad I had the right uh, taken care of. So, um, you know, the first thing we did, obviously, we 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 do intracoronary imaging on all our uh, interventions nowadays, and and so we did uh, IVUS of the left main, and you know, you could see that this really was a Medina one 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 lesion, and so my plan was to do just a DK crush uh, of the left main. You know, the, the question oftentimes comes up, you know, hey, it's a left main and it's a not a dominant circ, but at least a co-dominant circ, you know, should you use hemodynamic support? And I had measured his LV EDP before we started. It was nine. Um, he had normal LV function. He had an echo a week prior, which showed his EF was 60 percent. So uh, hemodynamically, it didn't seem like it was going to be necessary. And, and anatomically, you know, although it, it is a Medina 111, there wasn't a lot of, you know, calcium. We weren't going to need to do, pro, uh, you know, atherectomy with prolonged ischemia or anything else that would make me feel like I needed hemodynamic support. So so we we went ahead and just uh, fixed them without it. We upsized our radial sheet to a seven French. Uh, and I started by ballooning, you know, the left main uh, into the circ, and then I ballooned the left main into the LAD. Uh, and, and as soon as I, I deflated the balloon on the left main uh, into LAD, he immediately started complaining of chest pain and getting real fidgety on the table. And he had massive ST segment elevation. And so, uh, 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 and, and, and also his, his blood pressure dropped into the 70s just almost immediately. So I gave him some phenylephrine, uh, had him get some levofed started, you can see I took a quick picture there, uh, which showed uh, sluggish flow down the circumflex system, not filling most of the OMs uh, completely. And then you can see there's no flow down the LAD. Uh, shortly after this, he arrested, uh, went right into VF. We ended up uh, mm -hmm. shocking him, got him right back. Uh, he was not very happy at this point uh, and uh, ended up having to give him some epinephrine uh, to get his blood pressure up eventually. Uh, and after that, we had a you know reasonable uh, blood pressure. We did some uh, further ballooning of the uh, uh, left vein into LAD, and we restored flow. I, I didn't actually fluorosave a picture of it, but at that point, you know, kind of had a moment to like take a breath, and we decided to get uh, access uh, femorally. Uh, I quickly got a, a femoral uh, CP in. It took about three minutes from uh, the time we stuck the the artery to the time we had him on support. Uh, but despite this, uh, he remained hypotensive. Uh, ended up, you know, again, my plan initially was to do a DK crush, but at this point I felt like I needed to, you know, save flow down that LAD. So we stented the the left main uh, into the LAD, uh, left a so wire. Maybe, maybe I can ask Wisa, um, mm -hmm. what do you think, uh, or maybe ask Wisa, what do you think caused this? What do you think caused this? I mean, this is clearly, you know, crazy decrease in flow. I mean, even the OM looks even like embolic phenomenon. So I wonder if there was some culprit in the main, maybe some thrombus that embolized. I mean, I don't know. With some any, any thoughts? Yeah, it's, it's interesting. I mean, it looks like there's some calcification in the lesion. They don't look like an acute angry lesion to expect no reflow. It's very, very uncommon to have no reflow with left main intervention. Uh, my suspicion is, is dissection at the distal left main and uh, and maybe the flow that we saw that slow in the in the circ was from arrest and hypotension. You see that frequently, but clearly the pathology was no flow in the in the LAD. And I have a question for Jason here. What what kind of what size balloon did you use there? Did you size it one to one to the LAD or or? And the other yeah, question it, is, yeah, go ahead. It was a four millimeter, uh, four by twelve millimeter balloon by Ivis. His LAD and proximal circ were both four point five. His left main was five and a half to six. So, so it was it was aggressively sized, but not oversized. Yeah, and, and the other thing is when when you're doing a case like this, we're worried about about this. Do, do you have you, you sized already with an IVIS? Do you have a do you have your stents called out and like ready on the table for a situation like this? Because I'm thinking, 
in my mind, you've been on the left main and, and the guy didn't do well. The first thing that comes to my mind is just place a stand very quickly from left main to LADN. Yeah. Make it yeah. long just to cover whatever the section you created. Yeah, I, I had his circ stent on the table. <laughs> I think I had a four by 12 circ stent uh, that I was going to put in the circ and crush. I, I was going to leave the, the balloon in the LAD uh, distally, and then I'll drop my circ stent in, deploy that, and then crush it. So that was that was what I had on the table. I did not have a left main and LED stent in. Uh, and so, you know, the first thing I did when I got that first picture, I thought, I I kind of thought like Monos did. I was like, is that thrombus or what's going on? Because again, you, it's pr pretty rare in a vessel that big to have a dissection that shuts everything down. And, and with the sluggish flow, I thought maybe there's some thrombus there. Uh, but then after I ballooned it, I did another test injection and and at that point it looked like it was a dissection but at that point I had flow everywhere and I had a pressure so I thought let's just get them on some support real quick and again this was a decision making thing and I think in retrospect I would have done what you said was um, which is just get a stent in the left main to the LAD but in the back of my mind I'm thinking I've got a dissection I don't know if it goes down the circ the last thing I want to do is put a stent in his left main into LAD and then you know a, a dissection flap you know uh, effects flow in the circ, and so uh, I thought um, I, I still was thinking when I was putting the impeller that I was going to keep uh, going with my my original strategy of the DK crush. But after I got the uh, impella and got him on support, he was still hypotensive, and so that's when we decided to just get that LED uh, taken care of. So. We stented the uh, left main in the LED. It was persistently hypotensive and, and really had minimal pulsatility at this time. Uh, it gave him multiple doses of phenylephrine uh, and epinephrine, uh, and then and then uh, also started him uh, on some levofed. Uh, unfortunately, at this point, he kept having VF. So this was actually just after stenting the left main into the LED. You can see we've got really good flow uh, down all the vessels, but I just can't keep the guy out of VF. You can see at the apical LAD here, there's there's a little bit of a cutoff of the vessel. I ended up running a thrombectomy device down there uh, and ended up restoring flow to, to that uh, part of the uh, uh, LAD. But uh, but despite us, um, you know, giving him amiodarone and eventually lidocaine, he uh, he kept having VF. I think we shocked him five or six times and got him back. Uh, but then um, he uh, went into refractory uh, VF and, and we tried to fibrillate him like five times. And then before we finally got him back to a normal rhythm, did CPR. Uh, and then at this point, we got uh, access for ECMO. Um, and we had anesthesia there at this point. We got him intubated. Uh, and and it after by the time our ECMO team got there, it took us about nine minutes before we had him on ECMO. Um, at that point, um, this is kind of where we were at. I had stented the left main into the LAD. I had actually proximally optimized the left main portion of it, um, and uh, and then this was actually the TEE that we had. Uh, uh, you know, during the procedure, so you can see he's just hardly got any uh, uh, myocardial contraction uh, happening. So we ended up uh, uh, going in, and once we got him on the ECMO, he, he stabilized out quite a bit. He didn't have much pulsatility, uh, but we had a good uh, arterial, uh, mean arterial pressure. So we went back and, and kind of finished uh, uh, by doing a, a TM protrusion. Uh, again, not what I typically would do on a left main, but in a situation like this, it, it's what we had to do uh, and, uh, and got the circa opened and then uh, finished with a, a kiss uh, and had a nice uh, angiographic result. Uh, after this though, he uh, still was hypotensive. Uh, he was on a little bit of levofed. He was on dobutamine. Um, we ended up uh, sending him down to the intensive care unit uh, on ECMO uh, with the Impella uh, CP. Actually, turned the CP down to, to I think P4 because we were getting a bit of suction. Um, but uh, but even when he got downstairs, that we repeated a transthoracic, and he had really almost no uh, cardiac activity. He had uh, no pulsatility for for much of that uh, afternoon. 
Uh, and but by the time I left in the evening around seven, he he'd started to regain a reasonable amount of pulsatility. Uh, the next day, um, he uh, the, we put a PA catheter in. You could see his numbers there, um, and and again had didn't have any pulsatility. Um, the next day, he he uh, he was better. Uh, by the morning, he was off levofed. Uh, he was on uh, only two mics of dobutamine, uh, and then post-op day two, he was extubated and he was uh, decannulated from the ECMO. Uh, we tend to try to initiate medical therapy early, op and usually before the impella is removed. So they actually start him on captopril on post-op day two, um, and uh, and here's uh, his echo the the next day. You can see he's starting to gain regain some function. Not uh, not normal, but but getting better. Uh, and then on post-op day three, his impella was removed and his PA catheter was removed. And you could see his, his cardiac index was almost four by the time uh, his uh, his catheter was removed. And then here's the the kind of post-op day two uh, function was about forty percent or so. And then uh, post-op day four, he was pretty much back to to normal uh, function and was ended up being discharged on post-op day six. So um, this was kind of a weird case because it, again, you know, we, we, uh, this was obviously a, an unexpected hemodynamic collapse and, and likely, you know, because of the dissection and the left main ischemia. But the thing that was, was a bit different about this case compared to, to a lot of times when things like this happen is usually once you fix the vessel and you have flow, everything kind of, you know, levels out. But this guy just was so stunned, and then and then because of that, I think that's what was causing the the persistent VF. And then you know his heart was just at, at a standstill basically. And so uh, it was really a case where um, he he fell apart and fell apart fast. And then we just couldn't get him back. And you know fortunately we were able to get him on ECMO relatively quickly, and that kind of helped you know at least buy us some time for his for his heart to recover. And you know, I've had this happen, uh, I think, two or three times in the cath lab where, you know, we've had, a, you know, a, a hemodynamic collapse, and then they just have this stunned LV that doesn't work. And, uh, you know, my surgical colleagues kind of liken it to what they've, what they describe as a, that stone heart syndrome in, in bypass patients where, you know, it's almost like a reperfusion injury that where the myocardium just, just gets locked and, and doesn't work. And so, um this was kind of an eye-opening case. Fortunately, he he recovered and did, did uh, relatively well. So, uh, the no, that's an amazing case, Jason. And maybe uh, if we have any comments. Actually, one comment I want to make is that you know that's the importance of ECMO, right? You do complex PCI. Uh, you know, having ECMO. I mean, imagine this patient didn't have ECMO. Or ECMO available. I mean, it can be literally life-saving for many of those patients. So, I think it's. It's a great thing. And, and of course, the experienced team, like you know, yourself, Jason, and Ethan, and the whole group, be able to get him on ECMO very quickly and save him. Uh, Wissam, any comments at all? Yeah, I mean, this is an amazing case. I, I just want to draw people's attention. We think about no reflow also in the setting of, of acute cases. Uh, I've definitely seen no reflow in non-acute cases when you have kind of very uh, uh, the plaques that are that are voluminous and and the uh, patient can really can really not do well in these in these cases. We, we never know who's going to have more stunning than others. So I'm glad that uh, that you saved this case. Amazing case, uh, Jason. Yeah. Well, yeah. One more question that came from the audience, uh, Jason, is that about the RCA. People are saying when you have the stunning, sometimes you may thrombose your right coronary artery. So I don't know. Did you take any picture after this, or I guess you didn't uh, didn't uh, take any picture of the right after the yeah. the, the code. Yeah, no, I I didn't go back and take another look. It's not yeah. a bad it's not a bad thought, but uh, but I did not I did not look at it. Sure. Okay, uh, amazing save. I mean, phenomenal work. Yeah, thank you. So th this this next case is actually a case from about a year and a half ago, and it, it it didn't have a great outcome, but it's it's certainly something that's changed my practice and that I learned a lot from. And I I know we've got other great cases from Wisdom, so I want to try to get through this relatively quickly. But this was a gentleman that was referred to me for high risk PCI had uh, typical cardiac risk factors. He's actually from China and was here visiting his family. Uh, he was diagnosed with uh, coronary disease about 10 years prior where he ha was having exertional chest pain and an angiogram was recommended at that time, but he never had it done. And he'd had basically chronic stable angina 
uh, up until about 18 months prior to us uh, getting involved with him. In 2020, he had a two-week admission in China with heart failure, and he was diarrhea, still didn't have an angiogram. And he was endorsing nightly PND, orthopnea, and shortness of breath with any activity and was using two to three nitroglycerin a day. He was actually seen by one of my general co uh, cardiology colleagues in clinic on uh, New Year's Eve uh, 2021. And he was so dysmic just talking there and was having angina in the office. She sent him directly to the emergency room uh, and he was admitted for decompensated heart failure. Uh, in the uh, ER, he was uh, to Kipnik, so they actually put him on BiPAP. He had an echo that showed an EF of 10%, LV was dilated, moderate to severe uh, MR, had RV dysfunction, and had pulmonary hypertension. Uh, was diuresis for several days, uh, was a bit hypotensive at one point, so they placed him on some dobutamine. Now, eventually, our advanced heart failure team was consulted, and about five days after he was admitted, he got referred for angiography and a right heart cath with one of my colleagues. Uh, at that time, uh, you could see his pulmonary pressures were quite high. His filling pressures were very high with a, a LVEDP and a wedge of 30, and he had one of the lower fix I've seen, uh, 1.0 uh, cardiac index with a very low CPO and low PA sats. Um, Coronary angiography revealed his right was a CTO. Uh, his left coronary system showed a high-grade calcified lesion at the ostium of the LAD uh, and a flush occluded uh, circumflex as well with really not many collaterals. There, I think there was a small ON that you could see filling in uh, faintly uh, kind of late. But um, So he actually got admitted from the cath lab to the ICU, but down in the ICU, he, he kind of decompensated relatively quickly. He got tachycardic and tachypnic, couldn't lie flat. They put him on nitro and Lasix, and, uh, but he was still having some ongoing shortness of breath and chest pain. And this was in the middle of the night, so they decided to, uh, eventually to put him on a balloon pump, and he seemed to stabilize at that point. Uh, obviously, it was turned down for surgical revascularization given his shock and his, um, his very low EF, and, and the patient really wasn't uh, uh, interested in, in pursuing a transplant uh, course. And so they initially just treated him medically, and they ended up getting a PET scan on him a couple of days later that actually showed a considerable amount of uh, viability with only the infralateral wall uh, being infarct. So uh, he was referred to me for high-risk PCI. And so, you know, at this point, my plan was to, to do a right heart cath. They had removed his swan for some reason at that point. I was going to remove the balloon pump and place a CP, and then I was going to fix his RCA CTO and then stent his left main into the uh, into the LAD. Uh, we brought him upstairs. We did his right heart cath. You can see his numbers still looked pretty bad, but not not as uh, bad as uh, as uh, his initial right heart cath. But the thing that was notable is when they were wheeling him into the room, I, I heard the monitor beeping and I was like, boy, that, that is a really fast heart rate and turn around, sure enough, his heart rates are in the one teens. Um, his blood pressure was somewhat borderline and that should have been my first clue that I should have stopped uh, and, uh, and, and taken a different course. But, uh, you know, I, I plowed ahead with my original plan and uh, we got dual access. And again, we were gonna fix the right first uh, here's kind of our just our setup shots. We ended up, you know, getting the right dissected uh, relatively quickly, and then he had some really nice septal collaterals. We were able to uh, go uh, into the septal, but as soon as I put the microcatheter into the septal, uh, he lost pulsatility, and so I pulled the microcatheter back, and then just did a balloon inflation of that uh, distal left main in the LAD, uh, and then I went back in with my microcatheter. Uh, and at that point, he seemed to be tolerating it okay. Uh, I was able to get retrograde relatively quickly uh, and then uh, set up for a reverse cart. Uh, but as soon as I like dissected his right and was trying to get into my anterograde guide extent extender, he started getting uh, uh, some drop in his pressure, losing some pulsatility. Uh, and then I got my wire externalized. And then he, at this point, he's getting really restless. We eventually got anesthesia there and got him uh, uh, intubated uh, and sedated. But at this point, he's very hypotensive and we lost all uh, pulsatility uh, and ended up having to give him some phenylephrine and some epinephrine and briefly did uh, CPR. Uh, this was probably the fastest reverse card I've ever done because I knew that this guy was not going to tolerate this for very long. But I also didn't want to give up my wire position. I, I'm kind of stubborn, I guess. Uh, and so 
did a quick uh, tip in just to get all of our uh, retrograde gear out uh, and then ended up getting a, a wiggle wire into the distal vessel. Uh, and then, you know, obviously because of what happened, we checked his left system just to make sure we hadn't created any more uh, damage over there. Uh, and then uh, uh, that looked okay. And then we were able to kind of quickly fix the right uh, and got a nice result on the right. Um, throughout the time we were working on the right, though, he continued to have a narrow pulse pressure, if not fully lack of pulsatility and running on the impella. We ended up putting him on dobutamine uh, and some levofed, but we weren't getting great impella flows. Um, and it was, uh, we weren't quite, ex quite sure what was going on because we weren't getting suction alarms. Initially, we thought, I, I thought it was because of his right heart failure maybe, but usually you'll get suction alarms. But I ended up calling my advanced heart failure team and they, they thought, well, let's, his PA pressures had climbed. So we put him on some inhaled nitric oxide in the lab. But uh, the thought was that, you know, he's just, his LV is big and dilated and maybe he's not getting suction alarms because he just hasn't, we, we just haven't fully unloaded his ventricle. And, and maybe he just needs some more right-sided support because his RV function was pretty bad. So we actually decided to put in a uh, an RP uh, before we fixed the left coronary system because we knew I, I knew how how he reacted when I ballooned open his uh, his uh, LAD he didn't tolerate that real well. So we ended up doing that, did rotablator uh, and stenting of the uh, left main into the LAD, uh, got a nice result there. Um, and after this, he did relatively well. He got down to the ICU and was hypotensive though, was on a bit of levo. Uh, and was was fairly uh, uh, acidotic with a pH of seven and his lactate was elevated, uh, but he responded relatively quickly to some bicarb. Uh, overnight, he had some hemolysis. We were able to wean him off levofed and, and was just on dobutamine by the next day. And his echo actually looked better, uh, but, uh, but he was having some ongoing hemolysis. Urine output was still okay, but then things started to turn south. Yeah, uh, we he ended up getting his RP out on post op day two, uh, but then he started becoming febrile, and then uh, a few days after that, his vasopressor requirements started climbing, and then he ended up uh, getting uh, uh, blood cultures that were positive uh, for gram negative rods and starting to have abdominal pain, uh, and then uh, after that, they the family decided to move him to comfort care, and so he he actually expired. And what I think happened is we, you know, he, we, this is a guy obviously was a, probably a longstanding vasculopath who was very tenuous to begin with. And we gave him a pretty good hemodynamic insult with what we did. And, and I, the, the thought was, even though we got him through the procedure uh, and we got uh, some, some improvement from a cardiac standpoint, that, that hemodynamic insult probably led to some bowel ischemia. Uh, and and maybe even some uh, uh, and which was probably the source of his his uh, uh, his infection and sepsis and so uh, this was a case that I really learned a lot of on and and I think the the big thing that I learned from it is that um, you know really get better hemodynamic support up front in this case and this has really changed how we approach these patients and I have a much lower threshold to putting in a surgical 5-5 five five, uh, up front. And that's kind of how we'll do it in these patients now. There's a lot of reasons for it. We tend to have much less hemolysis than we do with the CP. Uh, they, they can stay in. We have them placed uh, in the axillary artery. They could stay in for you know weeks at a time. The patients can ambulate with them. They just do much better and it buys us a lot more time. Uh, and, and even in the case like this, I would even consider, you know, putting a, an Impella 5.5 in and then sitting on them for a few days before we uh, get them up to the lab. And so we, we've taken that approach uh, with, with some of these patients who, who have really borderline hemodynamics and very, very poor LV function to, to going with a surgical 5.5. And it just buys us a lot of time. We tend to, to, to go into the procedure a little slower we tend to come off a little slower and they tend to, to do much better. And so this was a case where I really think I made a mistake just by not uh, recognizing the gravity of his hemodynamic uh, derangements uh, up front and, and really did not do the guy, this guy a service by, by jumping in and, and, and not having the right amount of hemodynamic support.
Uh, well, I think, Jason, first here. of all, thanks for sharing, because that's a phenomenal case. I think it's a very learning for everyone. And these are the cases we want to see because they give you a lot of learning. So thanks so much for, for sharing this. Uh, there was one comment on the on the on the comments, which actually I think may be relevant. Uh, they were asking whether losing the mar the acute marginals might have played a role. Now I think the RCA was very diminutive. So I'm not sure this was the key thing, but sometimes in these very tenuous patients, if you lose an acute marginal or a big one, that might create more RV failure than before. Again, just a thought. Yeah, no, it's always a good thought. And I I mean, you know, a lot of times we kind of blow off RV marginal branches. We kind of treat them like, you know, small diags or whatever. But, uh, you know, until, you know, the first time you have one a patient fall apart because they lose a one millimeter RV marginal branch, you you have a whole new respect for RV marginal branches. But his right was occluded proximally and was occluded all the way through the AV groove. And so um, I don't think that was a huge issue uh, in this particular case. And, and really, his hemodynamic uh, uh, insult started when we crossed his uh, LAD, because, you know, obviously everything was hanging on that LAD, uh, osteo sure. LAD lesion. And so when he got ischemic from that, that's when I think we got into trouble more from that than the, the RV marginal branches. But it's certainly a good question, because that, that obviously is uh, in the differential things that can, can impact uh, sure. or cause somebody to fall apart quickly. We saw, I'm I sure you were saying you're, something. You're, yeah, yeah, I was going to say that, Jason, you're being harsh on, on yourself. I think, I mean, this this guy, you, you did kind of a great job in terms of interventional outcome, in terms of, of uh, interve in stenting of both vessels. But I think his ventricle was kind of way far down in terms of how sick this patient is. He came in, he came in too sick. Probably you weren't going to be able to salvage him, even with hemodynamic support. Uh, sometimes we try to do things, but... Uh, well, these are the type of people that we cannot save, especially when they don't come acute. It looks like things have been building up for a while in his case, and he came with end-stage heart failure. Yeah, yeah. You know, we've had a few few folks like this since then. I I, I feel like I've done more cases on Impella 5.5 this year, this last year, than I have with Impella CP, you know, who have really, really low EF. And, and I think that the support for the 5.5 I think there's two things. One is it has to be put in by a surgeon in our institution. Our surgeons put them in. And and part of it is, is they get it one day. And then by the time they get to the lab with me, it's two, three, four days later. Oftentimes, these patients are in a much, much better hemodynamic state. And they tend to, to tolerate the, the, the insults of the, the intervention a little bit better. Uh, I'm not saying that this would have necessarily changed his outcome, but I feel like we would have given him a much, much better shot um, uh, had we had I taken a step back and said, hey, let's let's rethink our, our support strategy. And I, I don't know. It's always hard to know for sure. You can always uh, uh, look back and, and question how you do things. But it certainly has impacted me and how I approach these patients. And I have a much... Uh, um, uh, a lower threshold to consider a higher level of hemodynamic support um, in these patients who are so tenuous. Yeah, absolutely. And there's some some comments coming through the chat. Some people are saying, you know, maybe fixing the LAD first might have prevented that. I guess having yeah. um, the issue that which again, obviously retrospectively, it's easier to say, or potentially staging the LAD with another option. But obviously, the patient was sick, and you want to get more flow to the other vessels. So. It is one of those, as you said, these people are, are very, very challenging. Having strong support is important. And, uh, and you know, sometimes the 5-5 five, five may work, but, uh, you know, it's uh, people with heart failure, especially such advanced heart failure, who have complex coronary disease are a talent for everyone. So uh, thanks again, Jason. I think that was, uh, uh, both cases were phenomenal and uh, a lot of learning points, both in terms of having acuity compensation but also what can happen in people who have underlying heart failure and then they undergo a complex percutaneous coronary intervention. So thank you. You bet. And maybe then we will switch to, um, to Wisson. All right. Uh, thanks, Manus, again. Um, and uh, we will switch gear here from, from cath lab sick patients complication of hypertension to actual technical complications, which I'm not very proud of, but 
if you're in the business of doing complex coronary intervention, you will be seeing these things. And, and the key is to try to identify them and do something to try to mitigate it and, and save the patient. Uh, the first one is a perforation, which everybody's scared of. Um, a 74-year-old man with unstable angina underwent bypass with SPG to right PDA, SPG to OM. And for some technical reasons, the surgeon did not get a good result on the lima. So he took that lima down and put it on the SVG to the OM and was down to the distal LED. But the patient was not very stable afterwards. He was having ST elevations and um, hypotension. So we took him to the cath lab several hours later. And long story short, all the bypasses are down. So when the SVG is down to the OM, also the lima is down with it. And you can see the problem here is the distal LED, which used to be patent, is uh, totally occluded. The ostium of the LED here was the problem. The reason the patient was sent originally to, to uh, the patient was sent to bypass. And, and this was patent. And if I have a lima to this artery here, this happens. I'm, I'm sure all of us have seen that before. And if I have a lima that's still in place, I try first to go through the lima, see if I can salvage something. And occasionally you go through the native to try to open it up. In this case, there's no going through the lima. It was going through an SDG that was totally gone and thrombosed from the, from the ostium. So I went down here with a wire. And this is interesting because um, a wire here, this is a whisper wire that went down. You could see a balloon behind it. And, and it, it took a little working, but it wasn't that hard. And the wire flew down. I was confident that that wire was in the distal LED. And uh, we, we kind of do that a lot when we cross CTOs. I know I don't see the wire distally, but then daughter it down with the balloon. And this is a mistake here because I always tell my fellows, which is something we, we should never follow any, any gear on a wire where you're not 100% sure what it is. And it was somehow 99% sure where the wire was. But well, then a picture here showed this. And what happened is that it was, it was the site of the Lima insertion that, that bled. And, and the mistake is that should have double and triple checked that the distal wire is in a true lumen. And, and I still don't know here with the bleeding at that specific time, what the bleeding is from and whether the wire is in the uh, true LED distally or not. So, Had you ballooned that area? No, that was just going down with the balloon just to dot it to see what's going on because I thought maybe there's a clot at the side. I want to see where the wire is. I don't want a balloon if the LED isn't like taking a small vessel in a diag or something like that. But uh, and at that point, I didn't know where the LED, where the wire was. Was it in a small branch? Was it in a? It looks like an LED going around. He had a wrap around the LED. So the step here that people should do. I had a balloon already there. Kind of advance the balloon to the place or just before the place and balloon it to, to block the flow down in the vessel. And the solutions here, so you have a perforation and the solutions are prolonged balloon inflation, which which may not be a big option here because we don't know where that distal wire is. Placed cover stent also does not work here unless I'm sure that my wire is in the distal LED, which it could still be, but uh, if it is not, I would have created a big channel into the pericardium. And coil, uh, I would do that if if we perfed a small distal vessel or a branch of an OM or a diagonal, but I would not do that yet for that distal LED would be my very last thing that I would try here if everything else failed. Maybe you can ask Jason, Jason, what would you do in the situation where you don't know where your wire is, but you do have a perforation that looks fairly sizable like this one? Yeah, I, I think, you know, certainly the, the wire looks like it's in a typical course of the uh, LAD. The problem with, with this one is it's not, unlike other CTOs, usually you have distal vessel visualization from a, you know, a retrograde uh, uh, collateral or something. And, you know, because this is an acute occlusion, you don't have that luxury. And so uh, this would be one case where I actually considered leaving my wire where it's at, dropping a, a Suzuki catheter down over the wire and then doing a little test injection uh, down downstream. You know, you could be out of the pericardium, but I'd rather I'd rather deal with a uh, a hole from a, a Suzuki than a hole from a two or two and a half millimeter balloon. And so that'd be the one time, you know, we don't generally do a lot of distal vessel injections where we don't know where our wire's at, but that may be something to consider in this case. And then if if I felt like I was in a good position and my wire was at least in the architecture of the the of the of the, of the LAD, uh, then I'd do uh, you know a balloon tamponade um, and and get get everything ready to to put a covered stent in. 
Excellent and one question, Jason. I'm not sure the answer. I can ask Wisham. So if you have perforation and you have recent bypass, are there some chest tubes or something that can drain the blood? Are you going to get tamponade? I mean, I don't know the answer to this. I don't know if... Well, yeah, this guy did not have tamponade, so so I've I've seen it go either way. Um, um, this guy, this thing was most likely going through his uh, chest tubes. You could still see there are some tubes connected to the pericardium, so he did not end up with tamponade. Despite, I mean, if you see this in somebody who who is not post bypass, this is for sure like an like an immediate big tamponade. It's a huge perforation, but this guy did not. But still, it's a big. Uh, bleeding that you need to close it because he's going to exsanguinate from that if you're just like working slowly and you leave the blood to go out through the chest tubes. So yeah, so to, to Jason's point, um, at this point, uh, I wanted to kind of like know where the, the distal wire is because that's the key in this case is knowing where the distal wire is to solve the case. And and at some point, I, I didn't show that, but moving the wire around and moving the camera around, I got convinced that the wire is not in the true lumen distally. It's not, a, it's not in the vessel, it's probably in the pericardium because I went back and forth on this wire as the balloon was there closing the hole. And then I realized that the wire was 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 too free to be in a, in a, in a true vessel. And I don't know how it fooled me before that that's, um, I'm not proud of that. So so the key here is to get access into the true LED, which is very difficult when you have an exit point like that that's already been ballooned because I tried to block the flow into it, so I ballooned it. So now I had a I had a bigger hole than what I started with by just dotting this. So I tried here with multiple wires. I brought a wire down and I tried to to deflate the balloon just temporarily to see if a wire would would go down somewhere. I would try to wire also with the balloon inflated to try to close that kind of block that that hole that I created to see if the wire finds its way into the distal LED. But I was not successful, especially that I could not tell what the distal LED is, and I. I remember not seeing any big collaterals going down to that distal vessel. But then I went back and shot the RCA and stayed long on it. And if you focus hard, you're going to see that there's a little thing coming down here. Do you guys see it there? Yeah, yeah. So that's a very distal kind of the wraparound LED. It looks small and, and it's probably underfilled and might be kind of thrown both on top. So I thought... Well, I see where the wire, where the vessel is now, and I tried again to get a wire here to see if I can get down into the LED, and I, and I did not. So, uh, and then another goal... thought, uh, which I don't know if that could be an option, is you had an occluded vein graft, right? So, worse comes to worse, could you have just gone through the occluded vein graft that was going to the LED, and maybe just put a wire there just to mark the location of the true lumen distally? Very good point. I, I, the problem, you know what? I removed that slide. Um, this this vein graft is fresh, so you should be able to get in it. It looked like as if it's flush occluded, and it had a lima that takes off of from it. So at that time, I was not thinking about that just because of the complexity of the case. But but you're totally right. Um, the SVG would have led me though to the obtuse marginal, not to the because the lima was connected to the side, and there's no way I could have told where the side of that. LED of okay. the Lima okay. was connecting to the SVG. So here I decided that that my second best choice is to try to get an epicardial collateral and get to that distal LED because this is the only connection that I see to the distal LED. I have to solve it somehow if I don't want to coil this this LED. So I send the microcatheter down this RV marginal. You see here injection into the uh, collateral and it looks straight enough for me to try to to wire it on an epicardial collateral. And this is a sewer wire. You see, it's making the usual kind of taking the wrong branches back and forth, and and uh, eventually it finds its way down to where I think the artery should be. And you let the sewer is nice; you can let it just slide, and and it finds its way, and eventually it traveled up the LED. Let it play here. Wow. Wow, this is amazing. You know, retrograde under the circumstances. I mean, that's, uh, <laughs> especially through this tiny epicardial, I mean, that's uh, an accomplishment. So we uh, have amazing. Yeah, it's, yeah it's, I mean, it's, it's you, you kind of think that that the exit point of your of your anti-grade gear is, is going to be more up towards the top of the balloon where it's making that turn, but it actually was kind of down near the end of the balloon. Um, so there's a real, there's a really funny tortuous segment. My guess is that graph that's sewn in there created some, some, uh, you know, some some kinking maybe of the vessel that that made it uh, harder to wire integrate. 
Very good point, Jason. You see it, we see it in CTOs, right? We see how the artery gets tinted with Lima when you're trying to open up these, it's really a hard area to cross when you have an angle with a stent and it always looks looks funny and, and V-shaped. So yeah, you're right. That's really so here, not, not getting retrograde though. That's not, that's not, that's not an easy epicardial to wire. Yeah, well, I'm always lucky here. So, so that's good. That's and, and, and so, so you see here the wire, I tried to get the microcatheter down, very small uh, epicardial. It wasn't traveling easy. So I thought, let me try something else. I have here the wire as a marker. Let me try to see if I could just, uh, uh, now that I know where the artery is, I can like go down and see if I can get in it. And I did. So you see here the wow. ejaculated wire go down, finding exactly where the artery is. And now I flew down in the LED and I, and I, and I got it an integrated. So. From that on, the, the case is straight. Now you have a perforation, which is still not a good thing, but at least I have a wire in the lumen, which is which is key here. Um, and, and obviously, as I'm leaving the epicardial here, inject it with a marker catheter. Notice that I kind of like redirected the balloon down into that new wire now, the distal LED and balloon the area now to tamp it. But now at least I'm ballooning the eye vessel and shooting the epicardial to make sure there's no perforations. And then I switch the the guide from the right since I had two guides anyway. I might as well use it from the right up to the left and put in a new wire down into the LED, which which is funny. Once you balloon that, now the wires fly all very easily down in the LED and not through the hole. But I'll tell you, I I kept that balloon up for some time, and you don't expect that hole to 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 heal right just from balloon inflation because I've already ballooned that hole. So for sure, it's going to need a covered stand. It needed a lot of ballooning with MC balloons. The area needed a lot of preparation, but eventually uh, the fire stent went, went down and and uh, and I could deploy it and seal that perforation. And uh, from then on, I just stented that ostium of the LED, which was what the patient needed in the first place uh, instead of all this bypass surgery and looked good and, uh, and he did fine afterward. So lessons from this, and I think we discussed everything. I'm just going to go for the benefit of time quickly over them. Uh, I would not advance catheters, obviously, unless 100% sure where the distal wide is. That's a lesson we always kind of like teach, and and we 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 should not be 100. We should not be like overconfident uh, 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 all the time. Post fresh cabbage anastomosis side can bleed. I mean, I didn't really try a lot to, for that wide to actually exit that side. So it's good for us to recognize that. And if there's a perforation, first control the bleed, obviously. Uh, and in this case, uh, you should not lose access to the area of bleeding and don't lose uh, wire in the main branch. In this case, I had to wire the main artery anyway. Uh, any other thoughts before I move on to the next case? No, that was a really wonderful job kind of, uh, you know, thinking through it and, you know, taking a moment while your balloon's up, you know, you, you then you have some time to think, you have time to get another access, you have a time to go find that collateral, because finding that collateral and that that apical portion of the LED really, really changed the case for you, I think, because it, it it opened up the option of at least going retrograde to define the, uh, the course of the vessel. And then, you know, it was a phenomenal uh, job fixing that problem. That was great. No, completely agree with him. That was an amazing save. Uh, another thought, another thought you could have done. So this was retrograde salvage. Some, sometimes what people can do is dissect just proximal perforation, go knuckle, go down, then re-enter, and then use the flap to seal the perforation. Again, in this situation with the guy bleeding, I mean, obviously that's a high stake situation, so it's not easy to do, but that's another option. If you didn't have any other, any retrograde options, that might be one way to do it. Yeah, the final thing is to just say, I'm just going to get rid of that distal LED. I'm just going to coil that area. If everything else fails, if you're there for a long time and still bleeding, and then just fix the ostium of the LED, and the guy will have a big apical infarct. But it is what it is. All right. So I'm going to move to the worst, the, to the to a worst case, I guess. Now, <laughs> wow. Well, so, <laughs> We're excited. So, so when 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 Manus, when when you asked me to present cases of my worst complications <laughs> in the last year, I was kind of I'm, I'm not. I'm not proud of of these, and this 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 case did not end well. This this guy this guy expired, and I'm gonna put that there. But I hope there are some teaching points that we can come out of that. Which is, when you have complications, you go back and look at where what are the things that you did different from usual. Where are the things that you did wrong that you you could have done better, 
and this this is I do love complex cases, left main. This is a left main intervention, and and this I haven't had this complication before, but uh, we'll, we'll we'll go over it, and hope uh, never happens to anybody. So this is a 62 year old man with hypertension. He has some chronic renal insufficiency. His EF is 20 percent, and he was sent for worsening angina. Now he has rest pain and some unstable symptoms. So I cast them, and, and this is what I had. Um, not a not a very complex disease, I would say. The only problem with this is arteries is that you can see diffuse atherosclerosis. So you see left main here that starts fat, but it's not normal distally. It doesn't look super tight, but it's not very normal. And then osteum of the LED is not normal either. And the LED here in the mid segment gets subtotally occluded, which is probably what what's bringing his unstable symptoms right now. You see it feel faintly there, it doesn't have a lot of collateral. The RCA was fine, just similar vessel with some diffuse disease. The circ has diffuse disease here, distal OM. And I stopped there, obviously. I'm not gonna tackle. I don't do ad hoc. This is this is and this is not a super complex uh, case, but but it's still a diffuse case. We need to discuss with the patient. I would just jump in and start putting stents. I stopped talking to the patient about, about the potential of kind of all these osteum LED, distal OM, doing bypass surgery. He was adamant he did not want surgery, he just wants to kind of get fixed and go home. And I personally thought it was reasonable to do that because this LED here is subtotaled. You could put a stent and then I'll interrogate the left main uh, LED, both with IVIS and FFR and see if it needs further treatment. And we'll just stent it and might. My goal was to just put a stent, if it needs treatment, put a stent uh, across the circumflex and just get out. And this is what I did. So I crossed that LED, it wasn't that hard to cross and stented, uh, did IVIS and everything. And after the IVIS, which showed the osteum of the LED, this still left me not to be great. I FFR'd that and the FFR was not normal. I did IFR, it was not normal. So I decided to just keep going with stenting all the way back to the left main. And you see him, see me kind of like ballooned it and then sized it with the balloon to see the length. And I had a wire on the circumflex. And like I said, it was my, my goal was to, for provisional stenting. I'm putting the stent here and, and it looks like a good length up to the proximal, the proximal left main. And the couple things here that I did that are different from what I usually do is when, I, when I'm treating left main uh, with stents that go all the way proximally, I do a couple of things now. Number one is, is I'm always worried that my guide is going to deform the stent. So you always need to be worried about that when this when the when you're placing stents osteally. You also remember that you have a wire that's jailed. So in provisional stenting, you have a wire that's jailed in that circumflex. And if you want to remove it, you have to be careful that your guide is not being sucked in, that you're not pushing the guide and deforming the stent proximally. So what I do typically is I, I put it balloon which is usually my my potting balloon in the in the left main and I pot before I do anything distally to make sure that that stent looks nice and before even I inflate that balloon I'll take a quick puff and make sure if the circus paid it I'll just take the Y out and inflate that pot and the reason I do that is that if the guide dives in and deforms the stent proximally I already have a balloon there that would reform the stent when this happens so in this guy, I didn't do that. I didn't take the wire out because his if his renal insufficiency, I wanted to do things with minimal contrast. So, so and that's one of the first kind of like things that I made that is different from my usual that that contributed to the complication. So I ballooned here, I potted, and then I took a picture. And this is where my second mistake is. I should have been very happy with this picture and walked out because that that was my plan to do provisional stenting, this 50% osteal circ. But I said, well, I have the pressure wide on the table that I'm doing. Um, I'm, I'm not sending this guy to surgery. I want to give him the best result. I want to make sure the stent, the osteum of the circumflex is not ischemic. So I plans placed a, a uh, I, I attempted to place a, the, the uh, FFR wire that I had on the table already. Well, it's open, let's just put it in. So actually I put it in, I put the pressure wire down and it went down, but it started kind of sticking down here. And then as I pulled it back, it wouldn't come back. So I don't have these saved, but I'll show you what happened afterwards. So the pressure wire, which I believe probably went back because I had that gelled wire in the back and I did not want to puff to see where the circuit is. So I wanted to use the wire that's gelled to use it as a marker. It probably caught the pro most proximal strut and it got caught on the strut on the way back. And, and as I tried to pull and pull and it wouldn't come back and I'm trying to pull my guide, eventually just pulling on this on this wire that stuck deformed the stent and eventually accordion the stent. 
And that's what you see here. So when you have an issue pulling your wire, the next thing that you need to do is, is obviously, before you start pulling very hard on it, is put a microcatheter, which is what I'm doing here. Or if you don't have a microcatheter, you put a balloon all the way down to where the wire is and start pulling on the wire by itself or fixing the microcatheter because that prevents the guide from diving in and, and, and makes kind of like the force go down to where the wire is stuck. Because I'm pulling a lot, and, and this is these these cines here are after kind of like multiple tries of like 10 minutes of trying to get the wire out. And and you see how the stent already deformed, and that has contributed to the wire being further and further stuck. So so you guys can see that the stent is here accordioned and, and totally deformed. Mm. And that's that's where things are bad. And and then eventually I pulled very hard and I knew it was going to snap and I snapped the pressure wire. So now I have a pressure wire sitting here, which, 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 which is just the tip, distal three uh, centimeters of the wire, which is, which is not a big deal. I was going to just uh, salvage the case and, and rewire the circumflex and balloon and everything. Now, when this happens, you, you really need to be careful that now we have a jumbled uh, metal inside the left main. So there's a high likelihood of clotting there. And uh, I took a quick picture and, and clearly something doesn't look great here and it's kind of starting to look hazy and you know, not a great flow down here. Put him immediately on, on glycoprotein 2B3A because he's going to clot, make sure the ACT is high enough. And tried quickly to balloon the LED, but the balloon would not pass because now that wire is also, is also caught in all this, all this mess. And, and a, wire would not, a, a balloon would not go at all. Try the 1.5 Takuro balloon would not cross. Microcatheter would not cross. And at this time, the patient started, blood pressure started sagging a little bit. His ST started changing. And, and, and if you look here, what, what happened um, is, is the flow goes down. So flows goes down everywhere. And I, and I know the guy is not going to do well. What you see next is before he crashed completely, I put him on ECMO. So... I called for the ECMO team and came in and you see here the venous cannula place on ECMO because I knew we we're going to have problem and I'm having a hard time widening, not widening, but ballooning the LED. And so, so I thought, let me just control the situation, which is great. Put them on ECMO. Initially, pressure went up. Now I have time. So I had time to pull that LED wire out. I rewired the LED and placed balloons and to, to for the sake of time, I'm gonna go fast here. So put wires and balloons and did and did bifurcation balloon, bifurcation stenting. Clearly, I'm like jailing here everything, the, the wire that's stuck, but I was happy with it. Everything looked good and the flow looked good at the end. But the perfusionist is telling me that the patient is not doing well at all and and, and uh, the flow is not good in, in, in the uh, in the ECMO cannula. So so looking down and the outflow is not good, but unable to establish good good pressure. Notice that there's disease in the in the this is the ECMO return cannula. There's disease in the iliac. And if you look at the picture here, something is funny in this in this uh, uh, ascending aorta. So the question: Wow, did we dissect that ascending aorta? Is there a problem suctioning? Put an impeller at some point. Uh, did not work well. Still, the patient is not doing very well. And then after all that, took a picture of the aorta, and uh, I hope nobody ever sees this picture. But that's what you see. So um, mm. what's happening here is that the ECMO returned cannula was in diseased iliacs, and, and the blood was returned all the way into a dissection flap that traveled all the way up engulfed all the branches of his arteries all the way down into the ventricle. You can see how the whole myocardium is hematoma. And it's not a pericardial effusion because the vessels here reach all the uh, uh, border of the heart. When, when you see this, if it ever happens, it's like there's nothing you can do. The patient is, is, is gone at this time. And um, this case uh, is, is horrible and uh, made me not able to sleep for, for several months. So this, this is the case. And I have several lessons that I think I kind of like mentioned along the way, uh, but I'll, I'll leave it up to you guys to comment and, and see what you think. Well, with some this is uh, ever seen before. I think most of, not everyone in the webinar has never seen before. and. And the learnings are tremendous here. And I must admit, I'm actually guilty of the setting. I actually quite often will try to put a 
pressure wire on the side branch. And, uh, you know, I guess I was lucky I haven't had this get stuck the same way it happened here. Because end of the day, right, that was the turning point. When the, the pressure wire got stuck, then you pulled on it, and then that the guy did the accordion. That's where tr triggered the whole situation. But mm -hmm. I guess the lesson is that maybe we should be extremely careful of doing that um, because of the potential complications. I never realized you can do something like that. And then um, in terms of, I, I guess when, uh, I've had cases where the wire break, and sometimes, and I don't know if that's the case here or not, sometimes the wire unravel, and the, it's not the wire fragment per se, it's actually the fine particles, whatever of the wire that snap, that make, make it thrombogenic. So I don't know if that was the situation here, but um, again, very humbling case. And again, thank you so much for showing to us. I think this can really help in the future prevent similar things. Yeah. I mean, there are a few things that I've changed here um, since then, which I don't know if they're helpful or not. I mean, I'm, I've always been careful with the, I've done a lot of left mains, haven't had this complication, but you should, it only takes one case to kind of like make you even become more careful. And I keep guide away. I also don't, do not use thin strut stents because they can deform easily in these cases when, when you're treating from the LED to the left main. Um, and I stopped doing FFRs of, of uh, uh, bifurcations going through stent struts. Uh, and, and like I said, the first thing I do is postalic proximal edge, and I keep it the lumen when I take the side side wire out. I, 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 since that case, I don't leave that wire in any longer than what I need to. Just whenever I'm done, I'm just taking it out quickly. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. It's it's uh, it's interesting because I I routinely drop pressure wires through stent struts into the circ or into the LAD if I've done a you know a provisional approach, and I've never. Never had an issue at all with that, it, but boy, it makes me, uh, I'm going to have to really want to know that information because that's that's just scary. Um, is there anything in particular about the, um, like the crossing uh, with that, um, with the, the pressure wire that was difficult or challenging or, or I mean, or was what what wire did you use? I mean, I've just never heard that happen. I don't want to blame maybe the pressure wire, but but if you if you think think about it, it I think it it caught a proximal strut, right? Because you you have a stem that goes all the way to the ostium of the left main. Any wire can cross a proximal. We we don't think a lot about it, right? I mean, we kind of put a wire in, and if you feel that it's gone behind a proximal strut, it's not in the middle of your stand. Not a big deal. Usually, you take it back, and you rewire. You kind of like redirect. It happens to us a lot. But in this case, it went through the back strut, and I realized that when I pulled it back, it wouldn't come back. It just locked on it. And it's partly because the stent that I was using here maybe was a thin strut stent, and, and, and it kind of much easier to deform than the other stents that we typically now use in the, in the left main. Yeah. I guess, I guess if uh, in that situation, once the wire, you're getting resistance on the wire and it's feeling stuck, you know, maybe the first thing before you do your hard pull, which, and I know every time we get something stuck, and I I do this myself, the, the natural reaction is just to pull, you know, and and sometimes it's hard to to stop yourself from doing that and think, but in 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 this case, maybe, you know, maybe putting a, a balloon distally in that LAD, you know, that way when you pull, you know, if you do deform it or you do break it in a funny way or do to form the stents then at least you got a balloon distal and you can pull it back and at least get that led open still may you know mess up the mouth of that circ but but at least you would have the left main and the led stabilized but exactly uh, that's such a good point to jason i think i think this is why i'm what i mentioned here at this point is anytime i'm pulling anything from the side i always have a balloon in that main archie now in the main because his problem is that i could not get a balloon in that left main to LED to reform the stand that deformed one of the problems. The other thing that I want people, I, I wanted to show this because you won't see this, but I want people to 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 be aware of it if they use ECMO is that is that whenever you have problem with the return cannula and the and and you're unable to kind of get any pressures into the patient, think about that as a complication. You have to stop the ECMO and reevaluate for the section and the iliac. Yeah. Yeah, I've never heard of this. So essentially, you're saying this is dissection all the way from the femur on um, the iliac, I guess, all the way up around the arc, right? Exactly. If you think about it, you you have your your you have your all the blood that you're taking, sucking from the right heart, returning all of it into that dissection flap. It's going to go somewhere. So I mean, it took 
it took the time that I was working to fix that left main for all that to walk itself backwards and to fill the whole extravascular space, extra uh, subintimal space, and, and all the aorta and the branches. You see here, with with this view, you cannot see even the main vessel. You see the AO, the carotids are all the carotid, the subclavian, everything is dissected. Jeez. And the thing is, you can do nothing. As you said, you cannot do nothing about this, right? I mean, if you put an ECMO in an emergency, which this was an emergency, you don't do an iliac angiogram because you just write it's a matter of you have to get them on support. So again, I'm not sure what you can do to prevent it, but um, I guess, you know, just have to be aware of it that this is a possibility. Yeah. So I don't think there's anything we could have done different here, like in terms of this, right? This happened, it could have happened to anyone anytime, just probably it just, they, it was an iliac lesion and probably close to the cannula, and that's where the dissection happened, and there's nothing to, to be done about it. Yeah, but I, I agree. It's an amazing picture. Yeah. When we talk about like support and things, I mean, we can say about support, and, and maybe if we if if this was planned, would not have happened if you put them on support initially. But uh, but when we talk about support, there's always complications that can. I mean, this is a dreadful complication, but things can happen. So we talk about also five O and Bella auxiliary. I mean, all these things have their complications. You have to factor that in 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 mind when you're trying to treat these these complex patients. Thank you. Thanks again, Wisham, and thank you so much, Jason. These were amazing cases. I mean, you truly did show us the worst complications and you know i mean myself i had a death last month so i know how hard it is to go through this and how hard it is to share them but i think nothing everyone including myself are very appreciative because the learning is huge you learn the most by seeing serious complications like this and both to prevent them and know what to do if this happens so thank you both so much thanks everyone for being part of this webinar